Hey, uh, our next presenter is Dr. John Whitcomb, who, along with Henry Morris, wrote the famous book, The Genesis Flood, that came out in 1961, that was a watershed event <laughs> about the flood. <laughs> How's that? And uh, he and Dr. Morris are considered the fathers of the um, modern creationist movement, which I certainly subscribe to, Young Earth and all of that. You know, the Bible means what it says. In fact, I saw Ariel Sharon one time on uh, C-SPAN, and they introduced him as the father of the uh, settler movement. And he goes, if I'd have fought her, who'd have mutter? Ha, 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 ha. But um, I don't know who the mother of the creationist movement is. <laughs> mother Earth, that's it. Okay. You know, I've always wanted to meet her. And Dr. Whitcomb uh, is a graduate of Princeton in ancient and medi medieval history. And he got saved at Princeton. And then... Went to Grace Theological Seminary, got his master's and his doctorate there, and he taught for 39 and a half years at Grace Theological Seminary. And I believe you're 85 now? Only, only 83. He's only 83. There I go inflating someone's age again, you know. So, And he's going to do a paper today on... Uh, the two witnesses, and he's going to solve all of these things for us on whether they're going to be in the first half or the second half and all that kind of stuff. And it's just like some of these scholars out there that write books against us. Uh, who, who was that guy that wrote uh, the something about how we're destroying evangelical scholarship? Because uh, the people that are destroying evangelical scholarship – you know, these ones that believe Genesis is literal and believe that Revelation is literal. You know, that's destructive, apparently, to evangelical scholarship, according to this person. And so Dr. Whitcomb is a person who is directly responsible for both aspects of this. And, you know, he demonstrates that if you take Genesis literal, then you should take Revelation literal. And so we're happy to have you come at this time with that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Ice, and it's a joy to be here and to share with many of you that I have met for the first time. I've heard of some of you for years and years, and tonight, last night, and today to meet some of you for the first time face-to-face, -face, and I trust heart-to-heart. -heart. I hope you'll stop by our little book table as you go out of that next room on your right to the back and help yourself to our free literature, order forms, and so forth. And especially, I'd like to announce this beautiful tract in English and Chinese entitled Abundant Life Guide, Showing the Way to Heaven Through Jesus, Emphasizing the Creator of the World and the Redemptive Work of Our Savior, done by Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Some of you know of him. He has a church in the Dallas area and a large church in Manila in the Philippines where he and his mother, years and years ago, started a Christian school for Chinese students. 5,000 students there and a church of 800 people. And he goes back and forth from Texas to Manila and lectures around the world, please take one of these and go to a Chinese restaurant and smile or say something in Mandarin. And uh, that's where I was raised in China as a boy. Came back in 1930 speaking fluent Mandarin. And even though my parents were not believers, we were there in the military, and I wasn't a believer, nevertheless, God put China on my heart. And now we're in a process of putting all of our hundreds of lectures into Mandarin on CDs, hopefully perhaps even DVDs, to give away to the Chinese people, Chinese-speaking people of the whole world. So take one or more of those with you, please, today. We also have my personal testimony. It's called The Conversion of an Evolutionist. 
I was a godless evolutionist at Princeton University in 1942 and 43, and studying paleontology and historical geology and how the world evolved through billions of years. And I was a total evolutionist until God met me one night in my dorm room at Pine Hall through the marvelous, loving, gracious, Christ-centered ministry of a former missionary to Afghanistan and India who had graduated from Princeton back in 1913. And God used him to lead me to the Savior in 1943. And I, all things became new, old things passed away, and I tell you, friends, uh, I have never recovered. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> it is a joy and a privilege to be a part of your conference this year. This is my first time ever to have a part. I just travel so much. And I just thank the Lord for your stand, your position, your commitment, your perspectives, and trust that this may be the beginning of the best part of God's plan for this ministry until Jesus comes. Of course, our topic for this hour, I need not say, you already realize, I'm sure, is very complex. I keep seeing outstanding commentaries on the book of Revelation saying that uh, this is the most complex, difficult, controversial chapter in the whole Bible, that kind of statement. And uh, from the vast plethora of commentaries on Revelation chapter 11, we certainly have to agree that uh, there are some very heavy hermeneutical, theological, exegetical issues involved that we want to try to deal with fairly. And I I ask your prayer that we might make a clear presentation now and have a meaningful and profitable question and answer interaction following. Okay? Thank you again for coming. Uh, first of all, just a little kind of a background here. Uh, Hippolytus that we all hear about from time to time, uh, a great student of scripture in the early church, said... Uh, for when the three score and two weeks are fulfilled and Christ is come and the gospel is preached in every place, the times being then accomplished, there will remain only one week, the last, in which Elias, that's Elijah, will appear and Enoch. And in the midst of it, of that week, the abomination of desolation will be manifested, that is, Antichrist, announcing desolation to the world. I, I need not take time and, and energy to demonstrate to you that practically all the early Antonicene fathers were premillennial, in fact, pre-tribulational. And uh, even Augustine, or Augustine, as we sometimes call him, uh, believed in the literal kingdom, thousand-year kingdom, at the beginning of his career, and then changed. Of course, that brought stupendous confusion to the church for even to this day. Why God allowed that, we don't know, but God makes no mistakes. And uh, we, we just go down through the centuries and, and, and look at these testimonies. Here's one from 1349, which certainly wasn't a time when dispensationalism was prominent, was it? <laughs> The greatest opposition to Antichrist will come from the preaching of Enoch and Elias, Elijah, whom he will destroy after 1260 days. That is, the Antichrist will destroy uh, Enoch and Elijah. They will rise again after three and a half days and ascend into heaven. Antichrist will then reign for three and a half years. So you notice that uh, Richard of Raleigh of Hampola believed in the early part of the 70th week of Daniel for the ministry of Enoch and Elijah. Okay? And I'm going to try to demonstrate later, I should say it right now to clarify. Uh, for various reasons, I do not believe that Enoch's fellow companion witness will be Enoch. We'll discuss that question later. Okay? But almost all the early church fathers believe that a literal Elijah would come back and that his companion would be Enoch. And of course you know why. Because it was viewed 
that and understood and agreed that those are the only two men who've never died and therefore since it is appointed unto men once to die that they have to come back and die that's the whole basis of the identity of the second witness as Enoch all right now my theological uh, mentor was Alva J McLean for a number of years at Grace Theological Seminary and and you should all own possess read study his masterpiece the greatness of the kingdom and on our table we have an order form a big one there from BMH books that publishes his volume we order it that way please take one and get this book sorry I don't have samples of it in my book table he said the kingdom of God is in a certain and important sense the grand central theme of all holy scripture and by the kingdom of God of course he's referring especially to the thousand year kingdom on earth for which Jesus taught us to pray it is in this kingdom that the Father's eternal purpose and the incarnate Son should be certainly and completely fulfilled. My comment, for many centuries the church has been subjected to various spiritualizing interpretations of Old and New Testament prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ. It is our prayer that God will raise up many faithful students of his word in these last days who will search the prophetic scriptures in the belief that God actually, now this is a shocking statement, that God actually means what he says. <laughs> All right, one more quote here. Anybody ever heard of Sir Isaac Newton? He said, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies. I think he was enlightened about the pre-trib study group. <laughs> <laughs> and insist upon their literal interpretation. Imagine this. In the midst of what? Much cleverer in opposition. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Well, here we have arrived, friends, at Israel's 70th week and Christ's second coming, where the rapture the resurrection, I always have to correct that statement. It isn't the rapture first, it's the what? The resurrection of dead Christians first. Okay, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, harpazoed, into the air in the clouds of glory to meet the Lord. Okay, And so that the resurrection and rapture of the body and bride of Christ is the first event to inaugurate what we know to be Israel's 70th and last Heptad Shavuach week, seven year time block before the kingdom comes. And there's a very complex series of events that begin at that moment in heaven, correct? The Bema, the judgment throne of Christ, where every Christian will be evaluated by Christ for what he has said, thought, and done since he was saved or justified to determine his salvation? No, to determine what? Rewards. And that needs to be taught and clarified and emphasized. The New Testament makes an enormous issue of that. Uh, Peter was almost terrified at the thought of judgment must begin first at the house. Of, if, if we are scarcely saved, what will be the end of those who know not God? My. John was terrified. Little children, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we shall not be ashamed will have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. John was concerned. Peter was concerned. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. And things will happen there that are perhaps a little shocking to some Christians. We're going to be evaluated, examined, searched by eyes like a flame of fire. And we will be, and some will suffer loss. But we will be saved, yet so as by what? Fire. Fire. Oh, what's that mean? Okay, I'm glad that's not my topic this moment. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's going on up here, isn't it? We sometimes forget that during the 70th week of Daniel, God has a massive ministry toward the body and bride of Christ that he's preparing, of course, for the marriage supper events over here all right 
But our focus, of course, in this hour is what's going on on the earth while that's going on in heaven. What's happening on this planet during those seven years? Well, of course, we all agree that uh, God is preparing Israel and the Gentiles, the nations, for the kingdom. As well as the church is being prepared up here, Israel is being prepared down here, and the Gentiles, the nations, as well. All right? Now, let's take a close look at the two witnesses of Jerusalem. And you, uh, you can't see this little diagram very well. I, I can't even hardly see it myself, but these are supposed to be two lampstands here, seven branch candelabras, menorahs, okay, which represent, symbolize the two witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, you can see, by the way, I have prepared the chart that I prefer the view that the two witnesses are in the first three and a half years, and we will now discuss that. All right. If you care to turn with me to Revelation chapter 11, let's begin with verse 1. And there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Rise and measure the temple of God. Now, of course, that was discussed at great length last night. I will just uh, summarize my understanding of this. This is a picture of the future temple of God during the 70th week of Daniel. And we're going to discuss how that will function as a temple, a legitimate, uh, theocratic, uh, Israelite worship center, complete with altar, sacrifices, Zadokian priests, and everything that makes it theocratically legitimate, okay, as a worship center. Now, there was no such functioning temple when John wrote this, as we discussed last night, of course, but there will be. Now, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. In other words, God is, in a sense, legitimatizing this and claiming it as, as his God-approved, God-honored, God-honoring system of worship. Verse 2. Now the negative part. And leave out the court which is outside the temple. And do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years. And uh, so I see most dispensa dispensational commentators agree that the holy city Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles for 42 months during the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. Compare Revelation 11.2 with Luke 21.24. This time period is identical to the 42 months of Revelation 13.5, which we'll be touching on a little later, which is the time God assigns to the beast, the Antichrist, to blaspheme his name and to persecute his people. This will be the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 7.21, namely that the little horn will make war against the saints and will prevail against them until the Ancient of Days finally comes. Daniel is also told that the saints will be given into his hand, the hand of the Antichrist, the little horn, for a time, times, and half a time, Daniel 7.25, and that after these three and a half years, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things should be finished, Daniel 12, 7. So we're talking here in Daniel's prophetic insight of the last three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, time, times, and half a time. Okay? That's when the abomination of desolation will be erected and will be the focus of Satan's worship program through the beast and the false prophet. All right. That is widely understood and agreed okay, by dispensational writers. Now the problem. Now the problem. Verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. In other words, they have a ministry of, 
of uh, judgment, of uh, sad, tragic confrontation with m massive unbelief, even on the part of unbelieving Israelites, Jews. So uh, the question is, well, what, 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 what are these 1260 days then? during which my two witnesses, my two witnesses, notice God claims these two witnesses to be his in a special way. Uh, well, what is this time period? Well, Dr. Walford helpfully pointed out in his commentary in Revelation, very prominent in the book of Revelation is the use of numbers. Namely, this is so impressive to me, Namely, two, three, look at these numbers in the book of Revelation. Three and a half, four, five, six, seven, ten, twelve, twenty-four, forty-two, a hundred and forty-four, six hundred and sixty-six, one thousand, one hundred, one thousand, two hundred and sixty, one thousand, six hundred, seven thousand, twelve thousand, hundred and forty-four thousand, one hundred million, two hundred million. The general rule should be followed to interpret numbers literally unless there is clear evidence to the contrary. You say, well, should we interpret even 666 literally? Yes. It literally says something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for some reason that we haven't fully discovered, it isn't 667 or 578. But uh, God expects us to take that seriously, right? Now, for several reasons, I suggest that, that uh, these two witnesses, God's two witnesses, will function in the first three and a half years right here. And my first reason is not a very powerful one, but I think it's worth mentioning. There seems to be an intentional distinction here between the time of the Gentile occupation of the temple's outer court and city, namely 42 months, which we just saw, 42 months here, and then he says that the two witnesses will function for 1260 days. Well, why two different time units used here? 42 months, 1260 days. My opinion is if the same time period is intended for the two witnesses as for the Antichrist, then why not just say 42 months? The Antichrist will function. And the two witnesses will function. But somehow there seems to be a distinction made between the time period that Antichrist functions and the two witnesses. That's just a little hint, a suggestion. There must be some significance there. But the second reason I think is more important. Namely that the very next verse, verse 4 in Revelation 11, the ministry of the two witnesses is compared to the ministry of the two olive trees of Zechariah 4.3. Namely, Joshua the high priest. And who's the governor? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Very significant. Now, friends, what did those two men do? They had an enormously significant ministry of leading the remnant of believing Jews back from Babylon to reestablish a God-honoring, legitimate Jewish worship program on the ruins of the temple, the first temple. And it, it was not without enormous struggle that totally discouraged Zerubbabel and Joshua. And uh, they, of course, as we all know, uh, sort of gave up. And uh, years later, God sent the two prophets to encourage them, Haggai and Zechariah, to get with it and get that temple built. And so in a few years then, from 520... From 536 to 5, 16 years, nothing was done. They gave up. Okay. Then four more years under the leadership of Haggai and Zechariah, the temple was finally built by 516 B.C. Now, here's the point, though. Those leaders did not have to wait for the temple to be rebuilt to do what? Ready? Ready? to begin sacrificing on the altar which they erected on the ruins of Solomon's temple. Ezra chapter 3 makes that very clear. The very day they arrived back in Jerusalem and saw the ruins 
of Solomon's temple, they set up an altar and started sacrificing to God. So what makes legitimate Jewish worship in the mind of God? Not a completed building, temple, but a what? A a God-honoring legitimate altar upon which clean, kosher animals could be offered, bloodshed, through what? Zadokian priests. Okay? That was done immediately. And I say that uh, the two witnesses will not have to wait until what? Until the temple is completely rebuilt that they will find in ruins, namely the present situation, Haram as Sharif. They don't have to wait for the temple to be rebuilt, the third temple, to do what? To start offering sacrifices on a legitimate altar immediately upon their appearance in Jerusalem. Now you see, at this point, we, we have to just stop and say, now Lord, now how could that happen? I mean, in 1967, we remember, remember the Israel, uh, the Israelis recaptured the temple, didn't they? Okay. Well, why didn't they start offering sacrifices? Because somehow there was a, I guess, a subconscious consensus that it's not time yet. May I suggest one little reason? Orthod- many Orthodox Jews say, well, Elijah has to come first. We can't do anything legitimate till he comes. Very interesting. But whatever their actual thinking about the matter was, they gave back the temple to the Muslims who, of course, have it to this hour. And Muslims have said to the Israelis, in effect, you may have your temple back over our dead bodies. Which means no. (laughs) So... Friends, just think of the enormity of this operation where all of a sudden my two witnesses appear and start offering sacrifices on an altar on the ruins of Solomon's, uh, excuse me, of uh, the second temple of Zerubbabel, uh, excuse me again, of Zerubbabel, yes, and Joshua, the high priest, which, of course, Herod expanded, but it was still the second temple, wasn't it? Yes. The ruins of the second temple will not in any way hinder a legitimatized, legitimatized sacrificial system being reinstituted. Okay? You say, but how can they do that? I mean, the Muslims won't like this. Right. <laughs> that is why they have to have supernatural protection against a global opposition to their function. That's the whole point, which we will see in just a moment. A huge opposition. Okay, to what they're going to do. Now, the reason why this will happen during the first half of the 70th week is that, quote, in the middle of the week, the Antichrist shall bring an end to the sacrifice, zevach, bloody sacrifices, and the offering, the minka, the non-bloody sacrifices, according to Daniel 9.27. Well, how can he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease if they haven't started? Very important point from Daniel's perspective. He doesn't explain, well, how do the sacrifices get started? Okay. And now we know. My two witnesses will have supernatural power against their enemies to accomplish something that is otherwise impossible. Okay. As Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost explains, quote, this expression... The sacrifice and the offerings refers to the entire Levitical system, which suggests that Israel will have restored that system in the first half of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, I think, frankly, that's agreed upon by all dispensationalists. I mean, that that the sacrifices have to start in the first half, right? Otherwise, how could they be stopped in the middle of the 70th week, you see? So that's, that's not debatable, in, in my understanding, among dispensationalists. The only debate we're dealing with now is where do the two witnesses fit into all of this, you see? Okay, now. Antichrist will replace the legitimate God-honoring Jewish worship system which only the two witnesses can inaugurate. 
That's my opinion. He, he replaces their system with his system, namely the abomination of desolation. But the Antichrist cannot do this. Are you ready? Until the 1260 days of ministry allotted by God to the two witnesses has been completed. He can't touch them or their program during that period. He is enraged. He is demonically, I mean, the, the hatred of the Antichrist toward those two witnesses is beyond description. But notice what's going on here, okay? Two witnesses here, and here's the little horn now appearing, who conquers the ten western kings, gallops forth, you know, conquering to conquer. Uh, Christ releases him and says, go. And off he went, off he goes. He'll, he'll do some amazing things here. And of course... This afternoon, uh, Rob Congdon will give a fantastic presentation on what, on what the, those ten Western kings are developing into in Europe today. I hope you'll listen on that, on that one. The, this all intertwines in a highly complex way. The contemporaneity okay, of the two witnesses with the Antichrist's first three and a half years of rising power. Now, my third reason for thinking that the two witnesses will be in the first three and a half years, is this, that the Lord Jesus issued this command to the Jews of the tribulation period, quote, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, you know, whoso readeth, let him understand. That's one of my favorite uh, supporting verses for mastering the book of Daniel. Jesus said, whoso reads that book, let him understand. Something special about Daniel, right? Now listen. When you see that abomination standing in the holy place, referring to the future functioning temple, see, not just a Muslim shrine or something, then what? Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, for then will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew twenty four fifteen and following. So here's the question. You ready? Would the two Jewish witnesses remain in Jerusalem during, what, the 42 months of Antichrist's dominion if the Lord Jesus, their Messiah, told them to flee to the mountains? He didn't say, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, all of you flee except the two witnesses. <laughs> Think of that, please. All right, fourth reason why I think they'll be the first three and a half years. Because if the 1260 days occur during the last half of the week, the entire world will be celebrating the death of the two witnesses for three and a half days after the Battle of Armageddon. Now, you see, when is the Battle of Armageddon? Here we go. You ready? It's exactly 1,260 days after the abomination of desolation is set up, right here. But th if, if they're going to be prophesying in the last three and a half years, then their death occurs at the time of the second coming, after which for three and a half days the whole world is celebrating and rejoicing over their dead bodies. Impossible. Think of it. The whole world will be in total... In, involved in total catastrophism. All the armies will be wiped out at Armageddon. The Antichrist is where? He's out, out of here. And the false prophet and Satan, they're, they're in the abyss. I mean, they're gone. Then, then how do you have people all over the world rejoicing at the uh, two witnesses being dead if all of those things have, been ha have happened? Okay. As Gary Cohen explains, he was one of our doctoral students at Grace Seminary back in the 60s, a Hebrew Christian scholar. This is his doctoral dissertation, by the way, on the chronology of the book of Revelation, 1966. He says, at the end of the second three and a half year period, the beast followers are lamenting over Babylon and its vials. They're gathered for the great battle of Armageddon over here. They are finally slain by Christ, whose coming is surrounded with the powers of the heavens being shaken. 
the picture does not harmonize well with the three and a half days of rejoicing and gift giving in which the earth dwellers participate following the murder of the two witnesses. This discordance between the end of the second three and a half year period and the three and a half days following the end of the three and a half year ministry of the witnesses makes it most unlikely that the prophesying of God's two servants takes place during the latter half of the week. Fifth argument. Putting the two witnesses into the last half of the week compromises the totality of Antichrist dominion during the same period. Now how can the Antichrist, now watch this, bring fire from heaven, this is Revelation 13, on all his enemies through the false prophet, okay? If the two witnesses are simultaneously bringing fire from, bringing fire from heaven on all their enemies, that's an impossible contradiction. Okay, so we're clearly de dealing with two different time periods here of the fire from heaven scenario. The first half of the week, the overwhelming power of the two witnesses, they're the only ones on planet earth that have the power to do what? Bring fire from heaven on their enemies. And the last half of the week, the overwhelming power of the beast and the false prophet who are the only ones in the world that have the power to bring fire from heaven during their ministry, quote unquote, their blasphemous perversion of God's truths. So when the, when the world asks the rhetorical question, who can make war with the beast, Revelation 13, it seems obvious no one can answer, well, the two witnesses are able to make war with him. No, why not? They are dead and gone. That's why. They're gone. Sixth argument. Our Lord stated, I take this to be very significant. Our Lord stated, Elijah is coming first and will do what? Restore all things. Matthew seventeen eleven. Now, whoever this Elijah turns out to be, which we'll discuss for a few moments later, God willing, his spectacular success under God in bringing Israel back to her Messiah must be during the first half of the 70th week. For Isaiah the prophet said that Israel will have given birth to her children before her tribulation begins. Isaiah 66, 8. So this radically transformed nation called the woman who flees into the wilderness in Revelation 12 and is nourished by God for 1260 days, see, is already a regenerated nation, basically. So the Satan during that time will make war with the rest of her offspring, of Israel's offspring. And what kind of offspring are these other ones? Listen. They are ones who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are believers. And I assume that that includes the 144,000 from the 12 tribes and the multitudes of their Gentile converts. All right? So the crucial question then is this, by whose testimony is the nation of Israel brought into the blessings of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 30, 32, and Ezekiel 36? Who leads Israel back to Mashiach, Messiah, who does that work? Who restores all things for Israel? See? And, and, and by whose witness are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes then led to the Lord in order that they can accomplish what Jesus predicted? This gospel of the kingdom, that is, the message of salvation apart from which belief you cannot enter the kingdom, will be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then will the end come. So who, who leads these people to the Lord right here in order that they can do all of this in the last three and a half years? Malachi gives the answer. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is this period here. 
And he shall change the hearts, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Harem, the last word in the Hebrew Bible. Now, friends, that's what Jesus was referring to when he said, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. Okay. Who's going to restore all things? Elijah will. So this has to be, you see, in the first three and a half years when all things are being restored. To me, that is a major point. If they don't even appear, start functioning until the last three and a half years, then who will have led the nation? Who will have restored all things then in the first three and a half years? Jesus agreed with Malachi, it'll be Elijah. But here's a problem, and this gets complicated. Some have said, well, the Israel can't be saved till they see Jesus. Remember Zechariah 12, 10, they shall look upon me whom they have what? Pierced. And for mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. But, but wait a minute, be careful here. That can't mean that Israel is not saved until the second coming. Jesus even warned us about this mentality. He said to doubting Thomas, blessed are those who have not what? Have not seen and yet have believed. Now, let me ask this question. Uh, when doubting Thomas finally saw the nail prints in his hands and the wound in his side, is that when he got saved? No, he was already saved. John 13 had already said that uh, the only unsaved apostle was Judas You've all, you know, been bathed. You're all clean, except Judas. So what was Thomas's problem? Friends, in his heart of hearts, he believed in Jesus. But when he actually saw him, he was overwhelmed with guilt and depression that he had had a part in what? In denying the resurrection promise of Jesus, his Lord. And he, he collapsed. My Lord and my God fell on the floor. That's what Israel will do, folks. They are already saved back here. But when they actually see Jesus, their risen glorified Lord, and see the nail prints in his hand, they look on me whom they pierced. They'll be overpowered with a sense of guilt for having been instrumental under Satan to crucify their own Messiah a couple thousand years earlier. And to have rejected him all these centuries, you see, and, and they will, Zechariah makes a huge point of this, they'll separate themselves, uh, husbands over here and wives here and isolated and individually, they will, they will just collapse and mourn for him. And probably state Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, yet we did esteem him stricken of God, afflicted. In other words, we confess we were part of the biggest problem the universe has ever known. The crucifixion, the rejection of Jesus by his own people, Israel. So here's my opinion, folks. Check me out, please, on this. Israel is saved back here by the end of the first three and a half years as a nation. But when they actually see Jesus coming in his glory, in the confrontations that are Enunciated. By the way, I just want to mention here, friends, that these confrontations, according to the book of Daniel, go on for, for weeks. Look at this. For 12, 1,290 days after the abomination of desolation is set up, there's a 30-day cleansing, purifying of the temple, 30-day period that Hezekiah used to cleanse the abominations of Ahaz, his father. 30 days, Judas Maccabeus used to cleanse it from Antiochus Epiphany's abominations, and then another 45 days to do what? The sheep and goat nation judgment, the confrontation of Israel, the remaining few unbelievers there in Ezekiel 20. Remember, I will take the rebels out from among them. Uh, the two in the field, one taken, the other left, is not the rapture of the church, is it? We know that, don't we? It's all of this process that goes on for 75 days after the second coming to purge from the human race all remaining unbelief. 
before the inaugural banquet of the millennial kingdom on earth can be experienced. So we have many things happening in here, friends, including what? Israel, devastated by the recognition at last that uh, they were guilty, even though by Gentile hands, Jesus, of course, was crucified, yet they were responsible for it before God. So I I say, well, Lord, I I just want to be sure here that uh, I have not misinterpreted Zechariah 12. I I really think that they'll be devastated. They'll be repentant. They'll be remorseful when they see him, but they're not going to get converted for the first time then as a nation. Okay. So immediately following the rapture of the church, now this, of course, is a controversial issue among all of us. Immediately after the rapture of the church, there'll be, by definition, no believers left on this planet. They're gone. So uh, here's here's my assumption for what it's worth. Assuming that God never leaves himself without a witness on this planet to himself, the two witnesses will suddenly appear in Jerusalem to begin their powerful work. I I can't see weeks or months or years going by between the rapture and the beginning of the 70th week. That's at least an opinion of mine. Something happens very quickly here, okay? Alva J. McLean, founder and president of Grace Seminary, where I taught, says, the effect of their testimony, the two witnesses, is very impressive. Appearing very early in the book of Revelation, probably accounting for the martyrs seen under the fifth seal, Revelation 6, 9, In chapter 7, the effect greatly expands, including 144,000 Israelites and also a great multitude which no man can number of all the nations. This, of course, is from his Greatness of the Kingdom volume. And his colleague and successor, Herman A. Hoyt, agreed, quote, the importance of their testimony of the two witnesses cannot be overestimated. By their testimony, it is my opinion, now watch here, we're trying to be careful to distinguish between clear statements of Scripture and our opinions on these things, is that they bring about the conversion of the 144,000 who will become the witnesses during the final half of the tribulation period. In addition to my personal mentors, McLean and Hoyt, several others have concluded The two witnesses will proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. That's the true gospel of the saving work of Christ as a prerequisite for entering the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom during the first half of the 70th week. And I have listed here in my paper uh, several dozen uh, writers who have come also to that conclusion. And I say, well, 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 this is impossible. I mean, how can two men, now think of it this way, how can two men lead 144,000 Israelites, Israelis, to Messiah? Well, think of how the Apostle Paul, one man, for two years, not three and a half, in the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus, teaching daily, did what? Uh, this is unbelievable. As a result, it says of his teaching there in that school, all they of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You say, now wait a minute. All they of Asia, that of course is all of West, Western Turkey would be today. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people. How could that happen? Are you ready? Here's the genius of the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you You say, that's impossible. The Bible's too big. It's too complicated. It's too controversial. In various passages, how can I do that? Here's the answer. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Trust me. If you obey me and really teach people in depth, long term, I mean massive indoctrination, the results are astronomical. See? Astronomical. And that's what you've got here. Two... By the time they disappear from the scene, the Antichrist who comes back from the realm of the dead, having been killed by a sword, Revelation 13, discovers to his horror, his, the two witnesses are gone, but he's, 
but he has 144,000 of them, 72,000 gospel teams of two men each spread all over the planet Earth. I mean, this is like discouraging. <laughs> and I, I say, Lord, help me to just see that where the church, the body and bride of Christ has miserably failed in this kind of thing, right? Implementing the Great Commission worldwide, see? These men will succeed. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to all nations and then shall the end come. Well, someone's going to say, well, Dr. Whitcomb, what do you think of the identity of the two witnesses? I, hope, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> This is very difficult. <laughs> okay. Well, one thing's for sure that uh, many Orthodox Jews, and I'm sure that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum could enlighten us on this kind of thing for us, for 2,400 years Jews have anticipated the literal return of Elijah as the forerunner of Messiah at the Passover meal, the Seder. Quote, there is an extra place setting and a special cup on the Seder table designated just for... Elijah, the meal is followed by a prayer, and a member of the family is then asked to go to the door, open it, and see if Elijah the prophet is coming. This expectation, of course, is based on the final words of the prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of children to their fathers. In other words, genuine revival that begins right in the home and the family the basic unit of human society. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Those words reverberated and are reverberating for 2,400 years. I will send Elijah, Elijah, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay? So when Peter, James, and John saw Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, folks, they were astounded. Could it literally be true that Elijah would personally, physically, visibly appear as a forerunner of Christ at the inauguration of his kingdom? So a week before he climbed that mountain, what did Jesus say to the apostles? Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see what? The Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And unfortunately, the chapter stops there. But the next verse says he took, he took three of these men with him up to a mountain and showed them a little foretaste, a visual aid of his second coming and glory. And guess who appeared with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Amazing, friends. So uh, why, why did uh, Elijah appear? Well... They asked Jesus that, that question. Why do the scribes say that G Elijah must come first? When they came down, they were fascinated, obsessed with this Elijah appearance. In fact, Peter made a colossal mistake that I don't want to make this morning. He was so overwhelmed by the appearance of Elijah and Moses that he said, let's make three tabernacles. One for you. Oh, that's nice. Jesus gets a tabernacle too. <laughs> And Moses and Elijah, let's have three tabernacles here. We have three great men here. Let's honor them. Blasphemy. We have one incarnate son of God. And infinitely inferior men called Elijah and Moses. Who get blanked out by God. And Jesus only remains visible. So in our obsession this morning at this hour with who, how great Elijah will be and so forth, let's remember Jesus is infinitely greater. Let's not get confused on that point. Amen. All right. So uh, Jesus answered him. I mean, this is it. He said, Elijah, indeed, uh, is coming first and will restore all things. So Jesus agrees with the scribes at that point that the prophecy of Malachi should be interpreted literally. Just like the scribes and priests told Herod, Micah 5, 2 should be interpreted literally. He will be born, Jesus, Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem. 
All the scribes weren't all wrong on everything, were they? No. Now, you say, well, sir, you, you just you, you omitted something here. Now, here's where it gets complicated. No sooner did Jesus say, Elijah's coming first, than he, he said what? But I say to you, Matthew 17, 12, that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Now, wait a minute. Do you see where we have a problem here? And this has caused tremendous controversy. Did Jesus say, no, Elijah's not coming? Because he already came and he was John the Baptist. Okay. And I say, well, Lord, now just help me here, please. Help me very, uh, I urgently need some help here. Let's stop for a moment and ask the question. <clears throat> How great was John the Baptist? Let me just quickly summarize. I'm running out of time. Jesus said he was a burning and shining light. John 5. No man ever born of women greater than John. That includes what? Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and even Elijah. He's very great. Okay? But you see, there's an antinomy here, theologically. The reason why his message, his appeal to repent, was rejected was not because he was inadequate or a compromiser or a failure. It's because, are you ready for this? It wasn't the time for Israel to repent. But at the same time, they, had, they should have repented. You see, there was what, divine sovereignty here? God knew that Jesus could not be accepted at the first coming through the ministry of John the Baptist. Or he couldn't have died like Isaiah 53, etc. said he would have to die. But you, no Jew could have said, well, I'm not going to believe John the Baptist because he said he's not Elijah. He admitted he wasn't, so that I don't have to repent. No, you don't determine your responsibility to God by the personality or the appearance or eloquence or lack of it of a, an evangelist, a soul winner. If the message is true to God, the Holy Spirit demands surrender. So Israel was totally guilty for what? not repenting at the preaching of John and Jesus and the 12 and the 70. They had no excuse for not repenting. I mean, Judas Iscariot could have said, well, if everything is all predetermined, you know, Jesus said, the Son of Man must go as it is, as it is determined. I'll be betrayed. Judas couldn't have said, well, it's all been predestinated and therefore I'm innocent. I'm just a helpless, innocent pawn. I have to betray Jesus to fulfill prophecy. No, Jesus said, better for that man if what? If he had never been born. Now, folks, that cannot be reconciled in our finite minds. Israel was totally responsible for rejecting John's preaching and Jesus and his marvelous sign miracle confirmations of his message. But God planned, this is Acts 2, planned that his son would be crucified by Israel at his first coming. Okay? So here's the point that Jesus is making. He said, if you had believed John the Baptist, if you had, and you should have, and you could have, the kingdom would be here. But since you didn't and refused to, the kingdom isn't here. In fact, it's now postponed. And Israel said, we will not have this man's blood to be upon us. We will not have this man to rule over us. Let his blood be on us and our children forever. And Jesus said, you'll never see me again. Aren't you glad he didn't stop there? Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what's going to happen. Israel will be saved, Romans 11. All Israel will be saved. Because God's promises are what? Irrevocable. The Abrahamic covenant is what? Unconditional. It has to happen. The nation will repent. At the second coming, 
through the ministry of Elijah, the prophet, whom God will send. Now, friends, I say, well, right here, right now, I mean, this, this is very complex theologically, is it not? And I just say, Lord, help me here to keep the balance and to be very humble, like Isaiah recommended. You remember God said through Isaiah 55, my thoughts are what? Higher than your thoughts. And my ways are higher than your ways. How much higher? As higher as the heavens are above the earth. That's infinite as far as we're concerned. God's ways are past finding out. You can't just arbitrarily, you know, manipulate the text of Scripture and make it come out logically on our level of thinking. Human responsibility is very important in the Bible. And divine sovereignty is very important in the Bible. But they can't be harmonized in our thinking. Both are true. And I say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. You say, well, you can't have Elijah come back. See? Because he's been glorified. Oh, really? I would like to make an announcement. He was not glorified. Jesus said so. You've all heard of John 3.16? How many have heard of John 3.13? No man, Jesus said, has ever ascended to heaven. Really? Really? And to this very day, not one human has ever gone to heaven bodily, which is what glorified means. Except who? Jesus alone. He's the first fruits of them that slept. He's the only human that has ever been, has ever experienced glorification bodily. Well, then what happened to Elijah? Now, this gets very difficult. <laughs> He was last seen disappearing into heaven. <laughs> and then God must have gently separated his body from his soul spirit and deposited his soul spirit into Abraham's bosom, paradise, upper shield, Hades, where all saints who have ever died, who ever died before the resurrection of Jesus, have been residing. See? See? I, I don't know what happened to Enoch. That's a little harder because he did not taste of death. I just understand that to mean that he had an amazing experience. Enoch did before the flood. I mean, like no one had ever lived before. He, he just simply disappeared. Where is he? Well, he just vanished. Thank you. Well, where did he end up? I don't know. I think I, I, he may have later, you know, like Elijah, I think. Deposited in that realm of departed spirits of the righteous. And I say, well, Lord, I just, I don't understand it. Well, let me tell you something else. I don't, I don't understand number 16 either, where it says a whole group of enemies of God and of Moses, the, the earth swallowed and they went down to Sheol alive. Now, my opinion is, for what little it's worth, is that they, after they disappeared, they died. Let me tell you another problem. Paul said, I was caught up to the third heaven, and I don't know if I was in my body or not. <laughs> but one thing I know, says Paul, I came back again with my sin nature for a mortal life. Thank you. Now, that is very difficult to resolve, you see. But here's a little hint, little hint. On the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke says, Dr. Luke says that Moses and Elijah weren't talking to the three apostles. They were talking with whom? Jesus, concerning his exodus he would accomplish. They were f obsessed with the question, Jesus, are you going to really die? I mean, they were saved on credit. That's Roman. <laughs> that's, that's the end of the... Third chapter Romans, Jesus died, you know, died for those who had, whose sins committed beforehand. Okay? But they were, in historically speaking, not yet fully redeemed historically. In the mind of God, yes. I mean, here's the antinomy problem again. They were, are you gonna are you gonna die on that cross? Which implies to me that Moses and Elijah weren't glorified yet. Okay? We know Moses wasn't because he did die 
Nobody saw him die, but it says he did. The end of Deuteronomy. So my understanding would be that these two men, friends, are still dead. And they will come back again. And die a second time. See, you can't die a second time. It's appointed unto men to die once. Well, we know better than that one. Many have died twice. Ask Lazarus about that. <laughs> now, in other words, you have a, a basic statement with some biblical exceptions. Like all have sinned, but I know somebody who never did. His name is Jesus. Thank you. So you had to be careful about those statements. And of course, many people, including the pre-trib rapture group, is eligible to, to never dying at all. What will that be? The rapture. Thank you. Tommy says so. <laughs> We won't even die once. But I hesitate to say of Old Testament saints that weren't part of the body and bride of Christ to whom that is an exclusive promise, you see, of glorification without dying. I hesitate to say that Moses, excuse me, that Elijah was glorified without dying. You know, Jesus said it's impossible for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. Moses never got there, neither did Elijah, but they will someday and they'll die there. And I say, Lord, I'm just amazed at the complexities of all this. But I just, I say, Lord, just help me now to put all this together properly and to see the enormity of this chapter 11 of Revelation. You know, the ultimate question, people say, well, why aren't they named in Revelation 11 then? And my opinion is that a Revelation is a capstone on a pyramid of previous books of Revelation, see, that it totally presupposes and assumes we've mastered the Old Testament. Hundreds of times the book of Revelation alludes to Old Testament out of 400 plus verses, over 270 refer to the Old Testament. And it's, it's sort of like the Spirit of God through Christ the Revealer. I don't have to tell you all the Old Testament details again. Remember, dear reader, Elijah will come first. You remember that? Remember what I said? Elijah will indeed come first and restore. Remember that? Remember that? And you know how is, is, you remember how Malachi ends, don't you? Listen to this. Moses and Elijah both mentioned at the end of Malachi. Okay? Moses and Elijah appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration. No one is more significant than Moses. In the New, he's quoted, he is referred to 80 times in the New Testament. More than Abraham, more than David, more than even Elijah. Moses is number one in the New Testament of what? Old Testament heroes of the faith who fought the enemies of Israel to a standstill under God. And the, new, the Revelation 11, it's like the Spirit of God saying, would you really like to know who these two men are? Look at the kind of judgments they will bring. Fire from heaven and three and a half years of drought. Whoever did that kind of thing? Elijah. Changing water to blood and bringing plagues. Whoever did that? Moses. It's almost like God saying, now, have you got the picture who these men are? So I say, well, Lord, I just, I just want to search the scriptures daily and keep doing it to see if these things are really so and thank you that even here, even here, I can take your word literally. So what did Jesus mean then when he said, <clears throat> Elijah will truly come first and restore all things? My conclusion is that he meant Elijah will truly come first and restore all things. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb, you told me one time that you thought the two witnesses would perhaps oversee the rebuilding of. Uh, the temple at the beginning of the tribulation. Could you comment on that? Yes. Uh, we uh, don't... Excuse me. Thank you very much. We are not saying the temple has to be rebuilt in the first three and a half years by the two witnesses. All that has to be established is what? 
an altar on the temple platform. That's all. You remember, this is three and a half years of an altar without a temple. Zerubbabel and Joshua had an altar without a temple for 20, 20 years, from two, 330, excuse me, from 330, I'm sorry, from 500. And 36 until 516. 20 years with a temple, no temple but sacrifices. So here these men are going to have three and a half years without a temple, I mean in its completed form. But the, the third temple will be built by Jesus according to Ezekiel 40 to 48 and other passages after the second coming. The uh, temple platform will be purged, you remember? For 30 days of the effects of the abomination of desolation before the third temple, the millennial temple, is built. All right, any other questions, friends? Uh, Dr. Wickham, thank you, first of all, for a great dissertation. I, outstanding. And if I may pick your brain a little bit, sir, as to the return of these two witnesses, how do you see them returning to earth, like the chariot of fire? In the case of Elijah, how do they get on, on the scene here? All right, very Thank good you. question. I hope you all heard the question. Do you, do you know who just asked you? That? No, sir. That was Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus de Cristo. All right. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, of course, all the Bible says about Elijah coming is in Malachi 4, I will send Elijah. And, of course, Jesus said he will come first. I'll send him and he'll come. But how he'll appear, uh, we can only imagine that, he, that just as Elijah disappeared, he will appear. And so uh, that, I think, is something we can't solve we just assume that God can suddenly bring them back to the world again. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Wickham. Enjoyed your study. My question pertains to the timing of the universal salvation uh, of Israel, which I think we all agree it's going to happen definitely by the end. And you're making the case for the beginning. And my only question that's running in my mind associated with that uh, is that if they universally receive uh, the teachings of Jesus as their Messiah, then, they, then it would seem like they would take the teaching of when you see the abomination of desolation, then get out of town and head to Petra. But at, at Jesus' second coming, he's saving, it appears to me, a remnant Jewish population still living in Jerusalem. So, so are those people in Jerusalem that he's saving um, saved Jews that believed in Jesus but just didn't get out of town in time? Or, or are, were there some unbelievers that didn't head to Petra? That's my question. I hope you all heard that. It's a very good question and very difficult to handle. Uh, let me explain why I think it's difficult. Because Zechariah says two-thirds of the Israelis will be wiped out, will die, be killed. Two-thirds before the end comes. Okay? I don't know what to do with Isaiah. He says only a tenth will be left. And, of course, Zechariah adds, even the third that, that survives will be purged as through fire. They'll be purged through this time. Well, are these that are killed believers or unbelievers in, in, among the Israelis? And, and how do you explain, like he said, that in Zechariah 12 and 14, when uh, Christ comes back to rescue the remnant in Jerusalem, how can there be any remnant in Jerusalem if they all fled to the wilderness in, Ze in Revelation 12? Well, I think you've got at least two different groups of Jews then. I think your point is well taken that many Jews who see the abomination of desolation uh, will flee and be protected by God for three and a half years from Satan. But some of them won't flee and will stay. Are they unbelieving Jews or are they believers or are they unbelievers that become believers? I can't solve it. I don't know. That is a very difficult question. How, how is God going to... I mean, even at the second coming, apparently there's some still unbelieving Jews left. Ezekiel 20. I will purge out the rebels that are still among you and not allow you to come into my promised land. 
Now, the complexities of that issue have yet, in my opinion, I haven't read everything on the subject, have not been clearly resolved. But God it makes it one thing very clear, <clears throat> that beginning here, it'll be extremely difficult to stay alive on this planet. If you're not wiped out by divine vials and seals and bowls and trumpets and everything else, the Antichrist will wipe out everybody else. And t by the time you get down here, how many people are left? Jesus said, unless these days are shortened to exactly 1260 days, what? No flesh, no flesh will survive. So you, you've got maybe a few thousand people left after billions have died. Billions. And that includes Jews. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but thank you. That's a good question. Dr. Whitcomb, I have two questions. Um, it says that you have said uh, that Elijah will restore all things. Does that mean that he could possibly be a geneticist so that he could restore the tribes? Uh, to Many Jews that you talk to don't know which tribe they're from. And I take that from Dr. Price's book where he found a, a DNA marker on the tribe of Levi. And I wondered if that would be a way he could do it. What do you think? All right. Uh, again, my opinion is that supernaturally, the two witnesses will be able to identify which Israelis belong to which tribe. Now, how DNA and all that fits into their, uh, their uh, identification of the tribal dis distinctions, I do not know. But it's very obvious that he has to know one thing for sure. Uh, who are the Levites? And not only that, but who are the Zadokian priests among them that are qualified to handle the sacrifices on the altar? So I, I, I've always believed that somehow God will make it clear at this period through those two witnesses who belongs to which tribe. And my next question, I was talking to a rabbi one day and um, I, I had mentioned that someday God may just pull that dome of the rock right off of that hill. And he said that the Jews felt that they were stewards of the three monotheistic religions on the face of the earth. And if that dome of the rock were removed or destroyed, that the Jews would be required to rebuild it. And I would like your comment on that. Yes, I frankly have never heard of such a view. I'm curious to know how many others have heard of that. Uh, I, I, I would say that's erroneous. Erroneous. No, uh, Elijah and Moses will not be ecumenical. <laughs> And it's just for that reason. I mean, when they move into that temple, folks, and take over, you see, there will be global horror and rage at what they're doing, which explains why, remember, after they are killed, the whole world rejoices at their death and the horrible punishments they inflicted on their opponents during the first three and a half years. So you've got a, a situation here where the Gentile nations in general and the world religions in general are horrified at what those two men are doing those three and a half years. Gradually, more and more Israelis believe their message until finally, basically the nation, not every Jew, but basically the nation is saved, but not Gentiles yet. That fits much better, in my opinion, how the whole world watching their dead bodies, maybe on television in the streets of Jerusalem, seeing all of a sudden they come stand up and are are taken to heaven. Uh, it'll be uh, followed by an earthquake, of course, that'll destroy part of Jerusalem. Uh, that, to me, fits the early three and a half years of their ministry, the first three and a half years. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you just mentioned about the earthquake, and right after that, it says the second woe is past. How can they be in the the first three and a half years if the woes are in the last half of the week. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess I missed the point because obviously uh, more and more of these judgments follow their death. That's why they are not dead after all these woes and 
trumpets and vials are finished. I mean, they're, they're dead said, before they're all finished. It says in the same hour there was a great earthquake right after they ascended. Yes. And then it says in the next verse, the second woe is past. So that was the second woe. All right, but you see there are more of them coming, aren't there? One. I mean, there, there's more judgments and vials coming after they're dead. The last three woes are the last three woes. All right. I guess I, I'm not quite clear on, on the question, well, so maybe <clears throat> afterward we can discuss that. Yeah, that may mean some of these judgments are going to take place in the first half of the tribulation. Okay. That's a possibility. Go ahead. Uh, had a uh, quite question and then a comment, if I can. Um, my question was, you had said that um, Moses and Elijah, we knew neither one of them died in Jerusalem. And I was just curious, do we know that the other prophets did, necessarily? That's a good point. We, we're not trying to say that every prophet died in Jerusalem. It's just that Jesus is making a, a proverbial statement about what? The horrors of the apostasy of Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem is so apostate through its history, on the average, with some exceptions, thank God, that it's almost proverbial that if you speak for God, you'll die in Jerusalem. So I'm not making that a blanket statement that everybody has, but you're correct. We should, we need, I'm, I'm not using that argument to prove anything. Right, but you said Jesus said that it's impossible for a prophet to die outside Jerusalem, right? And I just wondered what that verse meant then, if we, or do we know? I was just curious. Yeah, my, my understanding, he's, it's a proverbial statement of how wicked Jerusalem is. Okay. And my comment actually was just on your question. Um, my background's in molecular biology, and I've done some research on this. And they're very, actually very quickly getting to the point technically that they'll be able to identify the tribes. And right now, there's a lot of um, genetic um, testing of supposed lost tribes all over the world. And for the most part, you know, they're finding that people claim to be of Jewish descent actually do show the genetic basis for that. So it's just kind of interesting. Right. First, I want to thank you very much for this paper. Uh, up until today, I've been kind of ambivalent. And uh, you've presented a very strong argument, and I appreciate this very, very much. I'm curious as to how you understand the relationship between the Antichrist and the two witnesses, especially in light of the fact that at the beginning of the 70th seven, the Antichrist makes firm a covenant with the nation of Israel. And it, it appears that he has a favorable relationship with Israel, permitting them to worship. But if the two witnesses are rebuilding the temple and uh, there's this uh, animosity between the Antichrist and the witnesses, that seems like a problem or a, a, a bit of a difficulty for my mind to grasp. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gunn is a professor at Shasta Bible College in California. We've interacted before, not on this particular issue, but appreciate, Brother Gunn, your being with us today. But uh, my understanding is that, and this is very complex, all of a sudden, uh, Jesus said there will be a positive response of Israel toward the Antichrist. The only statement he ever made, in my opinion, about identifying the Antichrist personally. In John 5, I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not, but one is coming in his own name, and him you will receive. You, Jews, will receive the Antichrist, okay, as a nation. Well, that's what Daniel said. He'll make a firm covenant with what? Many. For one Shavuach, one seven-year heptad, okay? That's true. At the same time, however, uh, Jesus, in the light of Malachi's statement and Revelation 11, tells us there's another program going on simultaneously, which starts small. By the way, he starts small too. He's a little horn to start with. Daniel makes a point. He comes afterward and he's smaller, you know, than the others. But by the time you get to the end, he has achieved enormous power in the Western world, okay? But at the same time, so will the two witnesses who start small with only a handful of followers, see? He will have the majority at the beginning, they will have a small minority of followers at the beginning. By the end of the three and a half years, they have one under God, the nation, 
In the meantime, the little horn will have won the Western world, but not Israel. I mean, to honor him, to, to uh, follow him. So I see these two opposite trends developing at the same time in the first three and a half years. Thank you. Dr. Whitcomb, over here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, I agree with your identification of Elijah and Moses and, uh, and all that, but I was wondering why Elijah is so clearly identified, the Malachi prophecy, the statements by Christ in the Gospels. Why is Moses kind of left out in Revelation 11? They seem to be you know, equal partners, but why is, there no, why is Elijah identified? Elijah will come. That's real clear. Why is Moses left out? Why no prophecies that Moses will come type of thing? Right. Well, remember, friends, how Malachi ends. Let me read it to you. Because we all know Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. But have we remembered Elijah 4, 4, the previous verse? Remember the law of Moses, my, pro- my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, then I will, and I will send Elijah. Now, Jesus, of course, uh, well, let me say it this way. For some reason, the scribes focused on Elijah. I mean, enormously. I mean, when Jesus died on the cross, he cried out in Aramaic, what? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? And who did the Jews think he was calling for? Elijah. They thought he was calling Elijah to, well, well why didn't they ever talk about Moses? Well, they did. In, in John 6, they said, Moses gave us the bread in the wilderness. Jesus said, no, he didn't. My father did. In other words, there is a, a, an obsession with Moses in the New Testament too. But how Moses Uh, excuse me, why Jesus and quotes the scribes is saying Elijah's coming, Elijah's coming, is my opinion is because he's the last one mentioned in Malachi. Okay. Footnote on that, equal time is giving to Moses and Elijah in Revelation 11. Two miracles of judgment by Elijah and two by Moses. Remember, equal time in Revelation 11. Yes, sir. I want to thank you. It was very informative over here yeah. <laughs> uh, and very insightful. Very good. Thank you for your presentation. The question I'd like to ask you to elaborate on is it's so foreign to me. I, I have not heard the animal sacrifices coming back into the new temple. And so I'd like for your comment on that, please. Yes. Uh, this is a very great objection to dispensational eschatology. If we take the Bible literally, including all those prophecies in Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth about the animal sacrifices being reestablished on an altar in a temple, aren't we therefore minimizing what? Jesus. Well, we've missed the whole point. Uh, Jesus' sacrifice takes away sin, expiates sin. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The animal sacrifices never took away sin. Hebrews makes that clear. Well, what were they for? They were what? Temporary provisions by a holy God to protect the nation from premature destruction by entering into his holy presence in the worship system of Israel. And it's just like God said, you put, when you get out of Egypt, you've got to, you'll, you'll never get out unless you do this. I want to see the blood on the lintel and the doorpost and then I will do what? I'll pass over you. Now, does that mean that every Jew that left Egypt was born again? That his sins had been taken away? No. It meant that they were temporarily protected from destruction by the blood symbolism. It was a ritualistic cleansing, purifying ordinance that would never save anybody and never did and never will. What are, the, what are the animal sacrifices for? I mean, why set up an altar here and have it in the millennium too? Because in a new way, Jesus will be here in reference to Israel 
And Israel has to be protected from the wrath of a holy God by merely entering into his presence by the reestablishment, you see, of an Israelite protective program to honor the holiness of God. And it, I think it'll also have a retrospect. I mean, looking back on the blood of Jesus in, a, in another way, so forth. But the main emphasis in, in Ezekiel, as you know, and in Leviticus, is that that blood actually accomplished something. The animal blood accomplished something. It did what? It protected people from premature death in the presence of a holy God. And I think that is the issue that has to be investigated and studied and thought through. Because, friends, trust me, unless that's solved, dispensational eschatology collapses. Why? Because if there's no temple and no altar and no sacrifices in the future for Israel, then, of course, our whole literal interpretation of all those prophecies collapses. Thank you, Dr. Whitcomb.